In this episode, Ryan and I talk about stories from the front lines, and from those stories, we wind up talking an awful lot about debt and capital reserves. We had fun doing it, and thank you for listening. Welcome to the Making with Life podcast. I'm your host, James <laughs> Nethery. <laughs> I'm your co-host, Ryan Griggs. And so look, yes. the mics have been running, so we're creating some B-roll in the future, hopefully. But uh, Mr. Griggs showed up without a topic, so I'm welcoming him to uh, my side. <laughs> First time in Banking with Life history. <laughs> so we've been just chatting. We always chat, you know, uh, especially Saturday morning before we turn the cameras on. But the AV guy turns the mics on. I'm just telling you, there's some B-roll. And there's some decent stuff in there for posterity, um, if for no other reason. And uh, so I'm like, got it going. <laughs> he wasn't ready. But it's okay. Listen, you can't catch him off guard. I'll just mention something about economics or Austrian economics or the Austrian theory of the business cycle, and it'll trigger him, or paroxology or praxeology. Whatever. Yes. Praxeology. Or I can trigger him, I promise. But I won't. I'm just saying we don't have to have a topic. This is true. Uh, and what comes to mind, though, in the absence <laughs> of a topic, uh, are conversations from the prior week. And, you know, when I think we don't do a very well, I don't do a very good job of helping people understand when they should start the process. And, so you get people who have been online for months or years, endlessly researching, maybe feeling inadequate, like they don't have it all sorted out yet, so they don't start or get in touch with somebody. And then there's other people who they see some of the financial entertainment on YouTube mm -hmm. and they get in touch right away too soon. Mm -hmm. So without the proper education or proper research done beforehand. And so you get a mixed bag, right? You get people who have come from all different uh, degrees of prior research. And uh, you know, I think that the time to get in touch is when you've caught it. You kind of, you know, you're 80% or more. You, you, you see those cumulative net outlay columns and, and even, in an even distribution of age classes, part four of Nelson's book. Like you see that there's value there, but maybe some things are unclear. And, you know, I, in my view, my role is just to help clarify why things are the way they are. Like if, if we don't understand why something's going on, you know, what, why is it that cash value specifically, like what are the actual things causing cash value to rise in a contract, for instance? Um, you know, all those things can be addressed and there's, um, all that stuff is addressed. And so we have these, I have these conversations with people, sort of getting them up to speed from what Nelson wrote in 2000 and becoming your own banker to what they need to know now. And sometimes there's, well, there's these two alternative um, sort of opposite reactions, especially when it comes to premium level, right? Because the whole, in order to buy a dividend paying whole life contract, you know, in order to apply for one, to go through the process, take delivery, you got to choose how much premium you're going to pay across the two component premiums, base and PUA. And so that's where the conversation goes. And the differences between base and PUA drive the decision about the level, right? We can do different things with base and PUA. Base is obligatory. PUA is not. Uh, having flexibility in the PUA to varying degrees, depending upon your company, might affect how much total premium you do. So the, a lot of those conversations are around finding the right premium number. Okay, so here's the, the I, two. My head already hurts, man. I know. Saturday morning, a lot of advanced concepts. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it, I, don't, I don't want to interrupt you. So on the one hand, point. high premium, right? Mm -hmm. Premium equaling income. On the other hand, not enough <laughs> to get done what someone wants to do, right? So I, I have two uh, instances in mind. One, I think I might have mentioned them before, a couple, early 50s, two adult kids, nothing in retirement, okay? Their Very, house is probably paid off, though, right? All the equity in their primary No, it's residence. not. 
Oh, well, yeah. they, they're not even trying then. Well, okay. I uh, mean, there's just no, no assets. Like you I know. It defer. costs a lot of money to raise children. I'm not yeah. making fun. But, and and there's a number, you know, both of the parents are employed and there's a premium number that is high for them, but is possible that would allow them to acquire enough cash value 15 to 20 years down the road such that they could have, you know, a, a serious amount of annual cash value appreciation that would be enough to throw off loans to provide for a pretty solid, you know, lifestyle later in life. Uh, not going to replace their full income, you know, right. full household income, but substantial amount. Uh, and for them, it's like, okay, we, they kind of have to, I mean, I don't tell people how much premium to pay, but if you tell me what the goal is, and I say, like, okay, well, this is how we're going to get there. You know, it's kind of like the premium number is sort of on the edge of their capability, given their cash flow logistics. You know, what you talking the, about them specifically? Yeah, for this particular. Which generally that that should be where everybody winds up. Yeah, but it's a lot. You know, I mean, you go. It's <laughs> tough to start there, though. <laughs> it's a big number. And yeah. then, so, but it, to, the, the whole reason I brought this up is to me, it's weird. On the one hand, or not weird, maybe ironic. On the one hand, you got people who it's like, okay, to do a a, a significant percentage of their income. It would that would be required to do what they to accomplish the to build the kind of cash value they need to accomplish the goals they want to accomplish is kind of a sticking point. You know that was it's like a challenge. Like we're wrapping our mind around it. It's kind of well, like okay, so the premium amount. That's two different things, kind of. Or there's more than two different things, but fundamentally, you're talking the level of premium, right? To be able to yes, the total uh, total combined. Yeah, but then, but, components but before that, you mentioned, you know, the kind of a, a ratio between PUA and base, which I don't believe that that is where you start at all. And that is what is out there in the big wide no, world. No, no, I mentioned the difference between base and PUA. Like, understanding the differences between them can drive the selection of that total overall number. Right, yeah. okay. But then, too, it seems to me that that applies, uh, you know, a certain amount to the PUA is going to make that decision of how much total premium you pay. Did I mishear you or misunderstand? No, no. Saying? I mean, like, if someone understands that PUA is optional and that even with some companies you can catch up, uh, that degree of flexibility can allow somebody who wants to be more aggressive to choose a total premium level with a higher proportion going to the base than they otherwise might have. Thank you for breaking that advanced concept down for me because I completely agree. Yeah. That, okay, if I'm really going to achieve my goals, whatever they are, they're subject to change, but it's just going to take a lot of capital. I don't care who you are, right? Um, to look at that number sometimes, <laughs> premium that I need yeah. to pay, yeah. can be very intimidating. So, But here's the other side of it is you got, okay, but why can't I uh, use my whole income to pay premium? So yeah. two two different sides of the spectrum, yeah. right? Significant amount of premium that would be appropriate to get done what I need to get done, but mm -hmm. I'm kind of choking on the number. Sure. Other side... That just means it's a legitimate number. Right. If it causes you to pause or your wife to look at you, raise her eyebrow and question your intelligence, now we're talking about real levels of premium right. that you should consider. That's, you know... Yeah. We don't have to start there, I'm just saying, but let's get real. It's your money, your, yeah. your goals, your future, so... Let's don't play games, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. But then, and then on the other side of it, it's like, well, why can't I just use everything I made this year and pay premium? Right. And so navigating <laughs> the two trade off, the, the two, you know, I'm suspicious about doing enough in order to get done what I told you I wanted to get done versus I'm all in with you know, everything. Make the underwriter choke, <laughs> not the. <clears throat> not the uh, policy owner and what you see on the big in the big wide world my experience and i don't wake up every day looking on the internet about ibc i mean uh, i stay on youtube quite a bit but uh, for the infinite banking concept there's a lot in the big wide world to support this idea over here of uh, your whole income can equal premium mm -hmm. there's a ton of that right where there's very little legitimate in my opinion uh, support, encouragement, consideration, legitimate that supports 
a legitimate premium that legitimately meets your future wants and goals. So you can find all the magical presentations out there in the big wide world to show you how to, you know, make your premium equal your income. Yeah, I, I think a lot of people get to the point where they this isn't about capital. It's not about solving for the banking function per se. It's it's about doing something with a special twist to get like a disproportionate return out <laughs> right, of it. Right. You yeah, know, like sure. a, a clever magic trick. Yeah. Um, like a, a, almost like a get something for nothing kind of thing. A lot of uh, I don't want to be too hard on it though because some people are like, well, you know, th- we it's like FOMO. Right, fear of missing out on the special thing. Yeah. Like, oh, if I did this, it would be better, and I, I don't want to not be doing that because I just didn't know and I didn't explore it. So the part of me understands all that. Well, sure. Um, but, I, but then there's the indulging of that attitude, of that suspicion of like, oh, maybe there's some way to do this that I don't know. And then along come the financial entertainment types who are like, oh yeah, you could, you know, run all your expenses through. And people always, and you can always hear it in their voice, they start asking, you know, the, and they'll, they'll preface it, they'll use some sort of caveat up front and be like, you know, I don't I don't really understand this and it, uh, kind of trying to wrap my mind around it, but here it goes, you know. So they, they preface it already and then they get into it and it's like, I don't understand how, you know, I take my monthly check, I pay that in premium, it builds whatever cash value, I go get a policy loan to pay for whatever I'm gonna pay for for the month, and then next month I'm gonna go do that again. And it's like, where does that end? You know, this regular, systematic, new policy loan origination and constant stacking of loan against loan against loan, never with a plan to repay. And it's been indulged by a couple of the books out there and a lot of the videos of things like taxes, right? Just run your taxes through, just build up this loan balance. Mm-hmm. And it's always half the story, right? Like, okay, that, can you do that? It illustrates yes. as if you can. You, it's, it's possible to do that, right? <clears throat> but then people think, well, like, well, Nelson said, don't steal the peas. Yeah. So what, you know, where's the other half of this loan repayment story? And in the... Well, someday I'm going to, you know get a big windfall you know my grandfather's gonna die my grandmother's gonna die i'm gonna sell my business i'm gonna do whatever they kick it down the road right you know or you know <clears throat> we go get a heloc or we just keep doing cash out refis you know there's some kind of a uh i mean they justify it is my point they justify yes. it, but it's not it, it won't hold water you know it, it's not legitimate there's a lot of that. Well, it's like you want the other side of it. I mean, if you look at all of Nelson's illustrations and becoming your own banker, there's this stream of cash flow later in life. It's like, that's the other side of this. It, we're in Nelson's examples that are where he's just showing, you know, one particular kind of purchase, right? just little individual instances to convey the broader point. It, it's, it's not as though in any one example he's showing what someone could do at the maximum with all their cash value. But no. in those examples, one particular kind of use of capital he does <clears throat> show is the provision of cash flow later in life. And it's like if you're systematically buying policies, paying premium, and then collateralizing all the cash value you accumulate, that second half of the picture of having some passive cash flow is not going to be there. If you're fully collateralized by the time you get to golden year, well, time. there's always some kind of a, an, a a pool of capital somewhere that's generating premium in the future. Typically, I don't want to say always, because um, you'll see that like stacking policies, right? And I still see that to this day. As a matter of fact, I had a conversation this week. The young man went through a presentation that's prevalent in the you know infinite banking world. That, that the whole presentation is predicated on getting out of debt, <laughs> right? And then using these uh, Excel spreadsheets, you know, to, to show you how to get out of debt. But, and it's really obfuscated in my, in my opinion. It's not clear on purpose. And half the time the, present, the presenter, you know, um, can't keep the story straight all the way through. Uh-huh. <laughs> but, and so there's a lot of it, it allows 
the uh, it doesn't do anything for the clarity of what's going on in the life insurance policy for the consumer, the right. owner, the person putting their money in, right? But invariably, it's always, you know, they're buying another policy in four years or five years, and they're getting out of debt. There's so much smoke and mirrors is what I call it, you know, rainbows and pixie dust, that it's like, you're becoming dependent upon that agent, advisor, willingly, right? And I've said it before, because there's a lack of the ability to convey the power of the infinite banking concept. And then, therefore... You're also, or it's more likely than not, making the consumer dependent upon these exotic illustrations. Yeah. <clears throat> Without understanding what's really going to go on right. in the future, of what you're addressing, that uh, you, I mean, there's got to be capital, cash value in the policy to produce income in the latter years and or there has to be some kind of a cash flow producing entity, whether it's real estate, annuities, or whatever, mm. that's generating income that allows a premium to be paid for the leverage to continue mm. in, a, in a life insurance policy. And they illustrate beautifully. <laughs> and then, you know, in the lowest interest rate environment ever, recorded history, you know, what could go wrong, right? The mutual company changed their dividend scale. Interest rates go up. You're all yeah. leveraged up. Yeah, that, that's one thing I've, I've encountered too recently is on, on conventional debt repayment. I understand there's a lot of agents out there who commodify that and make debt repayment, like, or they make IBC just another option for debt repayment. And mm -hmm. there's been a specific experience with one of these people in the past, but uh, only one. Well, Where you been? one that I'm thinking of. <laughs> I don't. Um, I don't really. I don't know why you'd want that to be your niche, right? It's like oh, I'm just going to help people get out of debt because, at least to my mind, the the story of IBC with conventional debt repayment gets kind of complicated, like for most. Which is why I think there's these offices that use the Excel sheets and the Proprietary software, the software to do the presentation. To do the smoke and mirrors and mystify and yeah. get someone to say yes because it's like, oh, I got to pay this premium to build cash value and I'm going to take policy loans to transfer the indebtedness from the conventional lender over to the life insurance company. Now I'm going to have to repay those policy loans. And, and then, you know, you're years and years into this whole strategy and, and, and you got to follow the concept all the way through. <clears throat> I, I have some people who, I have friends who are not clients who eventually want to be, but are paying down their conventional debt first because that's what they want to do. And I think, and you've talked about it on a prior podcast, like it's okay to have the discipline to repay conventional debt. No, no, not isn't and it only, it, okay, it's required. I mean, I've right. lost, made, Lots of people angry, hurt their feelings or whatever, unintentionally, but, you know, the truth hurts sometimes. Because I have, you know, I'm not an Excel ninja, but I know some. Um, <clears throat> and, and I have done that 10 years ago, a long time ago, however long ago it was, a mm -hmm. long time, showing people how to get out of debt with life insurance, because you can absolutely do that. There's no question. Right. But what I discovered in short order not only is that complicated and laborious and if anything changes the whole example is wrong right. okay and everything changes i get a print out of that excel sheet yeah every every 30 days or you know yeah yeah and i mean you still have people ask for it all the time you know hey do you have that excel spreadsheet do you have somebody talked about it can they share that and it's like no no, no. absolutely not i've helped people get out of debt and Maybe 20% of them, 30% of them were very successful. The other 70 to 80, right? Um, it falls didn't apart. Didn't follow through. Yeah. And so <clears throat> it taught me a lesson. You know, I mean, uh, I, got, I gained experience and, and uh, they did too. So today, somebody calls and it's like, I want to get out of debt. I'll just tell them. Then they'll share their debt with me and understand it. I'll tell them, like, this is what you should do. You know, you should do this, this, and this, and then call me back. 
because you didn't accumulate all that debt with Uber Discipline. Yeah. And if you don't have the discipline to make the loan repayments, it's going to fail, period. And then if, you, if you're if all leveraged, you lose your job or your income. I mean, it's, you're like just redlining it, uh, and I'm not interested. So today, I hurt people's feelings from time to time. Can you get out of debt with the infinite bank concept? Yes, sir. Quickly, too. Mm-hmm. But is that where you start? No, not at all. Just like, you know, you shouldn't go get a HELOC on your home and, you know, start a policy that you can yeah. leverage 100% to buy cash flowing real estate, turnkey real estate. And it's just, when you take those examples all the way through, you're like, where's the meat? Where, how could this possibly work? And the consumer's like, well, I don't know, but it was so complicated and intriguing. It has to work. No, they're taking the fundamental principles that Nelson laid out and conveyed clearly and then demonstrated with the power of life insurance and then, and then doing their God awful, uh, contortions, to the policies to make it appear to appear better than it is. And mm-hmm. it just irks me to no end. So um, listen, if you if you're if you've got an Uber amount of debt and you want to get out of debt, then by golly get out of debt. If you want to practice the infinite banking concept, then you can do both, but it requires discipline and you need to work with somebody who's competent and experienced. Yeah. And not going to make you dependent upon some illustration or presentation or example it's kind of unfortunate because the the people who need to accumulate capital the quickest and the most systematically are the ones who are in debt Mm -hmm. like if that if to an extent you know that there's an an explicit stated use for capital (laughs) paying off that conventional debt right those people at least have as opposed to somebody who's no consumer debt you know in a good position on their mortgage or maybe they don't have a mortgage and there's not like an obvious place for capital like an an obvious use for capital you know they just might understand that it's good for them to accumulate it over the long term oh my gosh Uh, but but someone who's in debt who has an obvious like yeah if I had the money this is where it would go Mm -hmm. the ones who need are the least prepared to To, accumulate it to do that yeah yeah Successfully. Successfully. Yeah. Like the the mental, emotional, psychological stuff you need in order to prioritize your capital. I mean, in my mind, it's frustrating because it's like you're just stop prioritizing the lender's capital. Right? What? Pay them what you're legally obligated, the minimum, and then blow up your own capital and then abbreviate the lifespan of those other notes, which will eliminate or not eliminate but dramatically reduce the volume of interest dollars you otherwise would have lost to them you'll eventually eliminate it yeah eventually and and by the end of it once the debt is gone you'll have had this asset this that's accumulated this cash value over time that you'll go collateralize again for other stuff in the future it was becoming more and more efficient the whole every time day yeah but it's mere existence so that can work it does work but to actually do it, to follow through. Yeah. I mean, there's not, you don't have like immediate turnaround, you know? Um, it's kind of like dieting. <laughs> like, like, <you laughs> hey, gotta, wait, whoa, 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 what, what? Well, I'm you American. Gotta, you got to do the right kind of thing. And, it, and it's going to produce results only after an extended time period. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, but it will work. <laughs> <laughs> that 80 20 rule, right? What you put in your mouth is 80% of it, 20% is working out, but you do need to move. Yeah. I mean, it's okay to exercise, is my point, while you're dieting, starvation diet, or whatever. How about we just create some discipline? And it's a habit, right? Discipline is a habit. Every day you got to whoop Parkinson. Yeah. He shows up every day. Oh, whatever it is, you know. Okay. Well, listen, to, you mentioned that. I uh, spoke with a young man, young family this week, and uh, they're coming out of all that uh, get out of debt, mesmerizing kind of presentations where you buy policies every four or five years, and they've got very, like, very little debt. So that presentation is really dead in the water, but the guy, can, he's like, man, this is the most powerful thing I've ever seen. You know, they do real estate and other stuff too, but... So it wasn't just out of debt. But, and he's like, I love it because we're earlier we're talking about 
when is the appropriate time to call? How much have you learned? What are you learning? What are you watching? Just because you're watching a video about the infinite banking concept, you know, does not mean you're getting an education. Mm-hmm. All right, because there's a lot of stuff on the internet that's very good. And there's a lot more that you should just bypass, mm-hmm. in my opinion. But he, he started explaining to me, you know, this presentation that he was drugged through and, you know, my head hurt. And I told him it did. And he's like, it never made sense to me. <clears throat> you know, I don't, you know, coming up with the premium in year three or four, you're borrowing from other policies and you're taking over this debt payment. And yeah. I mean, it's like, it was so unclear, right. you know. Um, but he could clearly see that he's like, you know, he watched other videos. He goes, I don't know why anybody would want to be 100% liquid or close to it in year one. I mean, I think <laughs> the more they listen to this podcast and this channel and others, I'm not saying this is the only one. I'm just saying this is the best one. <laughs> they, because um, there's no pressure here, you know, and that's what really why they reach out. It's like, man, I've learned more from your podcast and y'all's talks and... um and then they have questions and they they want clarity and they want to know whatever it is they want to know that, that, that is uh, particular to their given situation. But uh, I love that. I mean, there's over 100 hours of video on purpose. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a place that you can go and learn on your own time. It'll answer questions. It'll create questions. Well, the contact information is below. If you have questions that need to be answered, I mean, we make it very easy. Yeah. And, and speaking of talk about doing the opposite of what's out there, I had a guy this past week. He's like, a, so we, you know, new client. We went to the first introductory call and then a longer call, getting into the specifics and stuff. And uh, he's like, yeah, you know, I, I, I'd, I'd rather do less term. Let's just go 40, 60 on this one. <laughs> right. You know, the exact opposite of what you find online, which is get yeah. the base down to as little as possible. I'm like, no, let's add a little more. You know, I don't want to eat up all that insurability. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, perfect. I had one of those calls this week too. The guy's calling, and he's like, "Listen, I, I don't, I don't want to do all that, all that incorrectly structured, you know, policies." Um, it's amazing to me that they listen if they've read Nelson's book, listen to his six and a half hour seminar, or at least read his book and and didn't start or stay in the the uh, infinite banking arena, you know, the people that, that have all these presentations and all these videos out there talking about all the stupid stuff, right? When you get really down to what we're doing, we're, we're, we're building capital appropriately to become our own banker. And we're not trying to mesmerize people and make this idea or this concept better than it is. And I'm just saying when people see through that, it's like, oh my gosh. They're like, they couldn't answer my questions. It didn't make sense mm-hmm. to me. Um, so I just didn't feel comfortable, whatever. And then they're like, the guy talking to you is like, well, let's just do 60 40. I don't want to do the term. They get the idea that just because the numbers on a page are bigger, you know, math is math. Like, if I seen a policy, Illustration. I don't ask for them. The guy paid ninety-seven percent to the PUA. Mm. So this idea that you can only do ninety ten is a lie. Okay, you're going up to the limit on those particular companies that they promote. You know, I'm. I was told this week, and I don't know that it's true. I don't know. I have a chance to share it with you. That uh, one of those companies has a. Uh, the fourth quarter of last year, policies issued from that point forward can't have a first year loan. Really? Well, now that's unverified, so I probably shouldn't say it. I should get so it. So you verified. can build all that cash value, you can't borrow against it though? For the first year. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just saying that that, that 90 10 might be Which a is limit. the Which is the natural extension of that, right? It's like if a company's going to let you do all that. You know, they can let you do it as long as you can't get to the money. <laughs> right. And then as long as you have to qualify in year two or three to continue that got off a ratio, right? 
So there's no question that the math is math. 90 is bigger than 60, you know, a 60-40 split. And whoever said that was right, just because Nelson did it, is that, does that mean that's the only way to do it? He only illustrated four years of premium payments and right. equipment financing, number one. And the people that say, oh, that's how you do it, either they don't have any clients or don't have any, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, their marketing's not working out for them. <laughs> so they have to sell their client a new policy every four years, yeah. right? Because somebody's got to get paid, right? Or they don't know what's going on in that illustration. Or, and or, probably cumulative, and they don't know what's going on today mm-hmm. in life insurance. But I'm, so my point is this, that is 90 bigger than 60? I mean, come on, yes. And so why, why do you want to compare, you know, 90, uh, 10 to 60, 40, like that's the only comparison, right? And and it and it applies to everybody. If you're 20, 25, 30, 50, or sixty, um, anywho, I, I go through this with people. You know, the trade off is for a given total <laughs> annual premium number, right? So we have a certain amount of premium being paid to all the components, base, term, PUA, in a given year. You know, certain number. The more of that number that goes to base, the higher the long-term cash values, death benefits, and what? dividends will be. What? Wait a minute. So if that's true, and it is, you mean, so people that are buying into this fallacious, erroneous idea that 90-10, or as I experienced earlier, and this wasn't the only time I've seen this, I've said it many times, you can go to 99-1, 99 to the PUA mm-hmm. and 1% to the base with legitimate life insurance companies. Okay, so if you can do that, and I'm squeezing down the most powerful component of a life insurance policy in the latter years. The further out you go, the more powerful that base premium is. So I want to squeeze that down to the bare minimum. (laughs) That doesn't even make sense. Well, it only makes sense if you don't know that, if you don't understand what what the trade-off is, see? Um, Or you do know and you don't care, like if you harm your clients. Well, I think to an extent, too, there's a you have to be willing to walk through the trade-off. It's like, because there's a genuine question, how much illiquidity am I willing to accept in exchange for the long-term value? And that's a case-by-case kind of thing, you know? Listen, I'm 45 pounds overweight. How many meals am I, uh, am I willing to, to modify or pass? <laughs> you know, how, how many workouts am I going to get up and actually show up at and you know, participate in. It is a case by case basis and it's a daily struggle. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's easy to sit and do nothing. It's easy to to like pay a premium if I have access to ninety nine percent of what I paid into or close to it. Yeah. Right? It's like a no brainer. Like, well, you know, I might as well not earning any money in the savings account yeah. or what in, in my mind, especially since in a in a recently filmed episode I don't even know if it's out yet we talked some more about equipment financing and just looking at those you know that stream of cash flow later in life or that cumulative net outlay mm-hmm. column you mm-hmm. know it's like either you've started that curve either you've initiated that growth curve and you're contributing to it or you've not and if you, know? you haven't you either don't know or you've got a really good a- Excuse that you've accepted. Yeah, you know, but the whole de- like the whole delaying thing. <laughs> you know, it's like oh, how however long you want to postpone that. And you were you, the you were the first to make the point, and to me at least, and it's so true that the longer you wait, the years of growth that you're cutting off from the contract are not the less efficient years in the earlier time frame. It's the greatest gains, latest in the life of the contract. The most efficient part of that contract. Is what you're cutting off. You're killing. You're killing yeah. it. <clears throat> but then, it, then it, it's natural. Listen, I'm uh, 50 something years old. And, uh, well, I'm too old. You know, I'm 60. I'm too old. I'm 70. I'm too old. I'm not going to be here. Well, that's selfish, isn't it? If you mm. think about it, let's just call it what it is. Right, these uh, the resistance to think long term. I That's get it. That's really what it is. Yeah, that is it is. But it's really, I think, it's selfish, personally. Right? 
Um, I'm not saying you're selfish. I'm saying that selfish thinking because you're not thinking in total. You're not considering the total picture, Mm -hmm. right? I'm not going to be here in 50 years. I'm not going to be here in 40 years. Maybe. With this, <laughs> the correct gene therapy that's not put out by Moderna or Pfizer. Right? I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, but that doesn't mean my people aren't going to be here. My children, my future grandchildren that may or may not occur. Or the organizations, I have, I have nieces, I have nephews. You know, I have grand nieces and nephews. So, um, I think Ecclesiastes, you know, vanity of vanities, everything that you've created, earned, saved, and didn't give away, spend, or consume, is going to be left to someone else. Mm-hmm. All right, so, should I be so selfish to spend everything? And you can do that. And I don't, I don't want to uh, come off too harshly. But if you have people or things that you love, ideas and organizations that you love and support, why would you want to cut off the most efficient part of that policy, mm-hmm. even though you may not directly benefit from it? It's the same thing as planting a shade tree. You know, so like, okay, you may not enjoy the shade because it takes so long for a particular hardwood to grow or whatever, but somebody is. Mm-hmm. So but just because you're not going to, does that mean you shouldn't? No. That makes sense. Oh, yeah. And I, as you were going through that, too, it, what came to mind is that you know every time we pay a premium base or PUA you know the it's it's paying there's a sense in which you're paying something forward right with PUA you're literally increasing that future every benefit yeah future cash value future dividends the future longer, yeah the everything long, the longer you pay base premium or the further you are into a contract the more dividends that have been issued that are getting sent to PUA that are continually increasing the magnitude of that future cash flow and the death benefit. When every, all that's going to go to somebody anyway. You know, yeah, it's like you, everything you. else happens within that nest. The only reason you get cash value, the only reason you get capital at all, the only reason you can take advantage of or take control of the banking function is because you're throwing out something for somebody else to, in, in the future. You know, the only reason the cash value is there is because the death benefit's there. And that death benefit is just something that somebody else is going to enjoy anyway. Right. And so no, the, no question. That's well put. Yeah, you, know, you only get these benefits to yourself. Well, listen, that's a whole because you're doing something for somebody else. <laughs> the whole concept of life insurance. You know, I did a Q and A, and the insurability came up, and I'm going to have to shoot a video and link it to this Q and A because they're talking about insurability and. Uh, skipped right over the most fundamental basic principle of insurability. You know, what makes someone insurable? Well, you know, there's human economic value, human life value, and income replacement. And there's different, you know, factors to determine someone's insurability, right? But at the bottom, the very bottom, very basic, fundamental, um, and the reason life insurance is tax-free, you know, income tax-free, is because it is a, it is a replacement of a loss, the death benefit, mm. right? It's not an investment. And whenever we've talked about it, I've said it over and over and over. When somebody mentions infinite banking concept and investment, that it is an investment or life insurance is an investment, you need to just back Next. up because yeah. it's not true. Either they're misspeaking out of ignorance or they know and they're just trying to like compare life insurance to an investment. Life insurance is not an investment. It's a replacement of a loss. If I die, my family loses all of my future income in addition to losing me, the greatest thing that ever happened to them. I'm, <laughs> I'm just checking to see if my wife is going to listen to this podcast, right? Um, I love them. They're the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. <clears throat> I said that on purpose for my wife. Okay. So the income, the death benefit is income replacement. That's why it's tax-free. So... The idea that you're going to leave something to somebody else is the very fundamental philosophy of life insurance. I'm thinking about someone else. I love someone else. Mm -hmm. I care about someone else or a cause or whatever it is. And if I die, if I, when I graduate, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. When I graduate, I still want them to be taken care of. And I'm not physically here to do that. So I'm going to, 
you know, leave a, a big honking pile of money, you know, to help yeah. ease their pain. So I'm just saying that fundamentally, philosophically, life insurance is based in benevolence, mm. right? And, it, and two, now I get it today, you know, we've got the nanny state, you know, the great society and, you know, all of these things that these great waves of socialism making the all-American individual dependent upon the government. I get that. Prior to all this uh, dependency, if we graduated, <clears throat> our family would be dependent upon the largesse of the family, other people that love them, maybe the state, maybe the orphanages. And, you know, you go back far enough, there was not all these safety nets. And I'm not against the safety net when I'm berating the nanny state. Mm -hmm. I'm not berating, you know, a safety net for orphans and widows. I mean, I think that's biblical and most people abdicate their responsibility to even do that. Mm -hmm. So I want to be encouraging. Don't don't abdicate your responsibility for life insurance. Okay. Well, all right. So if I don't love anyone, if I don't care about anyone, I'm surely not interested in life insurance. Right. Right. But if I do love someone and I do care about them and I want them to be cared for after I graduate, uh, life insurance is the greatest asset in the financial world. Oh, then comes along Nelson Nash, who's uh, had great experience with the bankers and understood their lineage, mm -hmm. right? Um, and said, listen, boy, your need for finance is greater than your need for death benefit. And then, boom, add scale to it. That was my one point with the uh, individuals who were had some debt, nothing in retirement, struggling to wrap their minds around the significant in, uh, uh, significant premium number. It's like uh, dividend paying whole life is the only asset with the features that you would require in order to be that aggressive, right? Like to to be able to use as much of an income as we're talking about to pay premium, to build cash value, to build asset value, to accumulate <laughs> value for later on. Like, oh my gosh. You, have, you can only do that in a secure, guaranteed environment, right? Non-market, non-Fed, non-stock market kind of environment. And it's, it's really only there, right? So, I mean, for Nelson to come along and show people how you can systematically accumulate capital, period. Right, because it's not like systematically exactly. accumulate capital anywhere else. Right. Because the value is always unguaranteed, always at risk, even in a checking account, right? Um, I, that's a pretty, big, accom a pretty well, big accomplishment. You know, the other side of that, too, is another fabulous phone call. <clears throat> I mean, what? how blessed am I? I get to wake up, beautiful family, beautiful country, and uh, get to talk to beautiful people, like-minded people. Oh my gosh. Um, I talked to another gentleman, <clears throat> he's a client, and but they come from the idea of, you know, get out of debt, stay out of debt, pay cash for everything, mm -hmm. which, <clears throat> you know, that's the opposite of in there. no debt, right? You have capital, that's the opposite of um, drowning in debt, right? It's like, so why would I pay a premium? You know, and then looking at these future premiums, beyond four years, right? So if we're gonna build an illustration that, you know, is is properly structured policy, um, beyond that, pay four years of premium and buy another one, right? That's why they do that. That's, in my opinion, that's why people build four years of premium, five years of premium, seven years of premium, whatever. Generally, not always. I mean, there's a legitimate purpose for short premium payment periods say that sometime. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying so there's, every situation is different. But in general, if I'm 30, if I'm 41 years old when I meet Nelson Nash and, you know, maybe I can wrap my mind around paying four years of premium because I don't have any faith. Well, there's a lack of faith that I started at such a low premium that I did. Uh -huh. But um, the, the future premiums can be intimidating. <clears throat> well, all the while, and we're just having a conversation. Well, um, you know, aren't you going to buy that piece of real estate anyway next year? Aren't you going to buy one just like it if you find it uh, two in one year? Aren't you going to do it again the year after if you find it? Aren't you going to do it again the year after that? And your business, 
oh, you're paying those annual taxes or those quarterly taxes? Well, aren't you going to do that next year? And you're going to buy the real estate? Oh, wait a minute. In your inventory, what, you're flooring your whole inventory? You know, look at all these. Just drive down the highway on your way to the restaurant row. You know, those restaurants are in the real estate business. Okay, but as you're going to restaurant row, you'll probably pass, you know, car lot row. Mm. You know, where all the new car stores are. They all coagulate together to make it easy for you, the consumer, to go buy and shop. Look at all those cars on that lot. You know, somebody's financing that. Mm -hmm. It's called a floor plan. You know, and if you pass the uh, automobile row, you'll probably pass RV row, too. You know, I have a friend that used to sell Prevost. Mm -hmm. Prevost, you know, top of the line bus, $500,000 for the shell. A million, million and a half by the time you have it all tricked out, out, right? So somebody's paying a finance charge, a float, a floor plan, a fee for all of those automobiles. Mm -hmm. Go buy the farm equipment. You know, it's like, all right, Mr. Businessman, are you going to have inventory next year? Yeah. And it's like, wait a minute, you, 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 all you got to do is walk down this conceptually, right, realistically and truthfully. It, You're going to do these things anyway, and somebody's going to profit greatly because they're financing it, and it might as well be you. Mm-hmm. And the quicker you get away from all these uh, entertainers, you know, and get to the meat and work with a competent practitioner, the better off you'll be. So. I'll, I'll have to uh, – <laughs> once I finish reading this book, I'll, I'll have to come back to it. But a guy named by the, by the name of Adam Mead, M-E-A-D, wrote a financial history of Berkshire Hathaway. Oh, yeah. And talked about how very early on they got into the insurance business. Mm-hmm. And they kept – the reason I bring this up, you mentioned the word float when you're talking about financing all these mm-hmm. things. And I just hadn't heard in that context before. And, they, and the guy kept going back to the word flo- – the author on this podcast interview kept going back to the word float, float, float. It's like, oh, (laughs) they're just using the balance sheet for the company that owns the insurance company with all that capital to go get other financing to go buy more businesses. (laughs) What? You mean (laughs) mean, mean these reinsurance companies (laughs) and all these hedge funds? You mean the Canadian private equity firms that are trying to, or that are going to buy a demutualized Mutual company, the company demutualized, so everybody get paid by the policyholder. So the private equity firm out of Canada can purchase them. And why does the private equity firm out of Canada want to purchase them? Because they have all of that capital in reserve. Oh my gosh! And you tell me they're Saving not time. practicing banking. They're going to leverage a fire out of that to buy other assets that they'll, you know, take private. Yeah. Those other assets. And then, you know, gin up the value, sell it to all the retirement funds and the teachers' retirement funds and the state retirement funds and the city pension plans all across the country, right? Sell it and then short it, bankrupt them, take them into bankruptcy, own the legal firm that does all that, take them over again, and then do it all over, take them private, make them really valuable, resell them. Yeah, it's it's just... Yeah. Interesting to me that the appetite or the attitude towards IBC is what it is, but <laughs> at the end of the day, in like the highest levels of finance in the world, you've got one of the major companies ever, <laughs> one of the biggest that, companies look, ever. But he's writing about that. banking on. <laughs> The reserve held by an insurance company. <laughs> what? Listen, that's nothing to do. Listen, everybody, you know, listen, when, whenever you discover the infinite banking concept and you get all excited about it and you start talking to your friends and they start shunning you, they shun you after they couldn't knock your excitement off of you, mm. right? And, and then after they've insulted your intelligence and whomever you're talking to, right? And it always like, what kind of commission do they make? Who are they? Who, who are they? Yeah. Or they're just an insurance salesman. What company are, is it? Any Ken to AIG. You know, and the whole thing, and I know that's going back in history, but life insurance companies are regulated by the state. AIG was a New York domiciled company, mm-hmm. right? So uh, their trading arm in Europe, and there's, I love my wife. I'm married to my wife. I'm not married to an insurance company. I'm not taking up them. But let's be clear. 
they had all of those capital reserves. It's their their investment arm in Europe that gets into all the derivatives or whatever, takes the company to the brink of bankruptcy, and then the Federal Reserve steps in and, and they they go to the state legislature and says, "Hey, can we borrow against your reserves, AIG?" The state's like, "Yeah, go ahead." <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's because AIG was a life insurance company. It's because they had the reserves, right, that they didn't go bankrupt or can't, a life insurance company can't go bankrupt. And there's, oh my gosh, there, talk about third rails. There's a lot that went on with AIG and the World Trade Center and financing entities and governments all around the world. And AIG was used as a tool. Why? Because they were a life insurance company and had all of that capital. It's because they were a life insurance company, because they had the reserves. That makes sense. Yeah, there's going to be a reserve somewhere if insurance is being sold. <laughs> and either the individual is going to have access and control over it or the people who run these companies are going and to. And the hedge funds are eyeballing the life insurance industry unbelievably, and it's nothing new. There, we can, I could list off. 15 or 20 companies that these hedge funds have purchased in the last 10 years. And Barry Dyke could, too. He writes about it. Mm -hmm. His fourth book is going to explicitly talk about private equity groups. And Well, why are they looking at all these life insurances? Because they had the reserves. So, and you, you should consider controlling as much of your capital as possible. Right. <laughs> Y'all might want to get in on this. <laughs> <Just saying. laughs> oh, yeah. All right. All right, well, that, sure, there's more. So you'll just have to tune in next time, please. <laughs> well, that was good. It's a little deeper and more yeah. abstract than normal. Good stuff. Okay, thanks for listening. Have Bye. a good day. Thank you for joining us on the Banking with Life podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe and click on that little notification bell. Otherwise, join us on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher for weekly content.